is they're aboard the Hogwarts Express. Um, and it's around page 164-65. The, the kids know, Harry, Ron, Hermione, Fred, George, Ginny, know something is going on at Hogwarts this year, but they don't know what. Um, and so they get into their cabins, and Harry, Ron, and Hermione over here Malfoy speaking on page 165. And we're going to try to get up to 362 today. So we'll see how well that works. And they overhear Malfoy. And Malfoy says, Father actually considered sending me to Durmstrang rather than Hogwarts, you know. He knows the headmaster, you see. Well, you know his opinion of Dumbledore. The man's such a mudblood lover. And Durmstrang doesn't admit that sort of riffraff. But Mother didn't like the idea of me going to school so far away. Father says Durmstrang takes a far more sensible line than Hogwarts about the dark arts. Durmstrang students actually learn them, not just the defense rubbish we do, etc., etc. Okay? So why is this little scene important? Because it says there's other schools. Okay. Harry learns that there are other schools. Who already knows there are other schools? Hermione. Hermione, because she's read, you know, Hogwarts of History, which also talks about other schools and stuff. Why else is it important? What's it tell us about Malfoy? He wants to learn the dark arts. Okay. What else? Okay, then, which we knew. Father wanted him to go to Durmstrang. But he's not at Durmstrang, is he? He's at Hogwarts. Why? It's not. Pretty close. Malfoy's too scared to go. I don't think it's that he's too scared to go. Is he a mama's boy? Yeah. I guess he doesn't like his father as much. Well, it's father. not that he doesn't like him. You know, he fears his father. Does he love his father? I mean, books one through seven, where we see Malfoy interact with his father. Is there, with his father, is there ever an element of love? Or fear. I mean, Machiavelli kind of, you know, which which kind of is it? But we're going to see later, there is love on his mother's side for him. She does something in book seven that's pretty impressive, okay? So I'm just throwing that out there. But we get introduced to at least one other school, Durmstrang. Now, Durmstrang is what's called a portmanteau word. The portmanteau word is where you take two words, two unrelated words, and butt them together. I often do it, you know, when I'm teaching because my brain's going faster in my mouth and I'll have one word and another part and I'll jam them together accidentally. It comes from German Sturm und Drang, which means storm and stress. It was a literary movement, late 18th century or very early 19th century, where, you know, essentially you put characters in a pressure cooker and you turn up the heat and you watch what they do, okay? This is this other wizarding school. Because it comes from this, okay, what do you think would be a defining characteristic of that school? Being stern. Stern. Hard. Okay. Like a military academy, possibly. Okay, So, we're not going to talk about it. Anything else? I don't really think. Malfoy knows what's going on. So they get to school, and we have the Sorting Hat song. Okay, Pages 176, 77. Now, when else have we had a Sorting Hat song? First, year. First book. Okay. So first book, fourth book, when are we going to hear another Sorting Hat song? Book five. And it's going to change quite a bit. Well, this one changes quite a bit from the first one. A thousand years or more ago, when I was newly sown, there lived four wizards of renown whose names are still well known. Bold Gryffindor, notice, by the way, I didn't put that up here. Bold Gryffindor, 
okay? From wild moor, fair means beautiful, Ravenclaw from Glen, sweet, Hufflepuff from Valley Broad, shrewd, right? Slytherin from Finn. So notice where these four came from, what kind of topographical features they lived in. Gryffindor, Gryffindor from the Moors, high, rocky kind of outcrop, exposed to the elements, Highlanders, if you want, Scottish Highlanders, okay? Ravenclaw from Glen. A Glen is like a valley, but Glens are pretty start, um, are valleys with real sharp, steep hillsides with a river down at the bottom. They're not, you know, like um, the Tennessee Valley, which is this broad, open, flat area with some mountains way over here and some mountains way over here, okay? Hufflepuff comes from that broad, open valley area. Probably, if we're thinking of Scotland as the topography, lowland Scotland, area around Edinburgh and, and that kind of stuff, okay? Slytherin, Finn. What's a Finn? Swamp, yeah, marsh, okay? So he's a swamp dweller. It's never good to live in a swamp. I mean, just, so, bold Gryffindor, fair Ravenclaw, sweet Hufflepuff, shrewd Slytherin. So what else are we told? They shared a wish, a hope, a dream. They hatched a daring plan to educate young sorcerers. Thus, Hogwarts school began. Notice, they were all famous, they're still famous, and they what? A thousand years or more ago, they shared a plan. They had a similar idea. They're all on the same proverbial wavelength, okay? Build a school to teach sorcerers. So, now each of these four founders formed their own house, for each did value different virtues in the ones they had to teach. So, each of these is a virtue. It's a positive, okay? By Gryffindor, the bravest were valued far beyond, beyond the rest. That is, bravery more than, at the very least, these other virtues, okay? For Ravenclaw, the cleverest would always be the best. For Hufflepuff, Hard workers were most worthy of admission. And power-hungry Slytherin. Notice, no epithet, no descriptor for Gryffindor, no descriptor for Ravenclaw, no descriptor for Hufflepuff, but Slytherin, but power-hungry Slytherin. Power-hungry Slytherin loved those of great ambition. For some reason, when we get talking about the virtues, we're told Slytherin. Well, if you want power, what does that say about you? You are ambitious. Just like looking at this, like kind of makes me feel like uh, Hermione shouldn't have been Gryffindor. She was only ten. We like find she been Ravenclaw. we find out later, Sorting Hat wanted to put her in Ravenclaw, and she chose Gryffindor. Why? She didn't have any at that point. Probably because she's read Hogwarts of History and knows the kind of people that come out of Gryffindor, okay? Which isn't slamming Ravenclaw at all. I mean, there are some pretty important Ravenclaws too. So, while still alive, they did divide their favorites from the throng. What's the throng? A ton of people. Okay. When first years first arrive, how do they first arrive? By boat across the um, forbidden uh, across the lake. Okay, they get to Hogwarts, and they're all just what first years. Okay, when Harry, Ron, and Hermione and Neville were on the train, they weren't yet first year Gryffindors. Malfoy wasn't yet a Slytherin. Okay. So, they did divide their favorites from the throng, but they need to choose. How are we going to pick them? 
how to pick the worthy ones when they, they who? These guys. Were all dead. See, while they were alive and Hogwarts was there, Gryffindor would choose people. Ravenclaw would choose people. Hufflepuff would choose people. Slytherin would choose people. How? I, I think we have to make some assumptions here. They probably had some kind of interview. And they got to talk to Travis, and they learned a little bit about it and said, Slytherin, you know, the guy wants power, etc. Okay? So, but once they're dead, how do you do it? Twas Gryffindor who found the way. He whipped me off his head. The founders put some brains in me so I could choose instead. Now slip me snug about your ears. I've never yet been wrong. I'll have a look inside your head and tell you where you belong. So notice what we're told about the sorting hat. It's Gryffindor's. It's Gryffindor's. That's why it looks old and raggedy and tattered. It's over a thousand years old. Okay? But it belonged to Godric Gryffindor. This is going to be important for later on. What else do we know of that is at Hogwarts that belonged to Godric Gryffindor? The sword. the sword. Okay. So, people start putting on the hat and Slytherin, Ravenclaw, Gryffindor, Hufflepuff, etc., etc. So, they have the feast. What does nearly Headley Nick let slip, kind of? And we're not going to talk about this much. How did the feast magically appear? House elves. House elves. And so what does Hermione decide to do? Well, she's not going to eat. She's going to go on, you know, hunger strike kind of a thing. Why? What becomes Hermione's cause celeb after the dark mark at the Quidditch? Spew, which is exactly how it's pronounced. Okay. The Society for the Protect or Preservation or pro, uh, Promotion of Elfish or Elvish Welfare. Okay? She wants to free the house elves. And she goes on that kick for a long time, but she eventually drops it. Why? Ultimately, in terms of the overarching plot, it's not important. It gets introduced, it takes some of our attention, it detracts our attention from some other threads of plots that are more important, and then it calmly gets ditched, just like the whole emphasis on Quidditch will ultimately get ditched. But Quidditch does introduce an important aspect of the overarching plot. What's Harry's position? That's the important. He's not just seeking the golden snitch. He's seeking his identity. He wants to know who am I? Why am I here? What is my purpose? Because unbeknownst to him, at the beginning of the first novel, he does have a purpose. Okay? When he asked Dumbledore that all-important question at the end of the first novel, why did Voldemort want to kill me in the first place? Dumbledore doesn't answer it. He says, you're too young. I can't answer it now. I'll tell you later. We get to the end of the fifth book. He finds out. Okay? And it's related to his being a seeker. Okay, So, we're going to skip a bunch. Um, they look up at the high table. Dumbledore gives his little speech. He talks about the um, Triwizard Tournament. Okay. And we find out, you know, the new Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher is whom? Mad-Eye Moody. Mad-Eye Moody. Okay. In the, um, so let's go on to page 202. Yeah, 202 and following. In the chapter of Mad-Eye Moody. So Malfoy makes a loud noise. That is, he makes everybody aware that Ron's father is mentioned in the latest edition of the Daily Prophet. But Ron's father is so unimportant that they get his name wrong. 
And he goes on and says, oh, look, and there's a picture, Weasley, a picture of your parents, page 204 at the top, outside their house, if you can call it a house. Ooh, your mother could do with losing a bit of weight, couldn't she? What you just said? Your mom's fat. Ron, your mom's fat. How old are they now? 14. 14 year old, male, testosterone's fun. Them's fighting words, okay? <laughs> Harry, notice Ron is shaking with fury. Harry, get stuff, Malfoy. Come on, Ron. Oh, yeah, you were staying with them, weren't you, Potter? Tell me, is his mother really that porky or is it just the picture? And Harry says, You know, your mother, Malfoy? And we get taken back to the Triwizard Tournament when the Malfoys arrive in the stands, okay? And we get this description that she has a look on her face like she's got something smelly around her. So Harry says, that expression she's got, like she's got dung under her nose, has she always looked like that or was it just because you were with her? So does your, old, does your mom always walk around with that scrunched up face? Don't you dare insult. Ooh, touchy subject, right? And then keep your fat mouth shut then. And Harry turns around. Why? He thinks, I got the upper hand. I got the better of him. And bang! Several people scream. Harry feels something go past him. And then we hear, oh, no, you don't, laddie. Harry spins around, and there's Moody coming down the staircase. His wand's out. And it's pointing at, and there's a ferret where Malfoy had been standing. Nobody moves. And Moody growls, did he get you? No. Missed. Leave it? Harry's like, I'm not doing anything. Not you. Because Crab reaches down for the ferret. Moody starts to limp towards Crab, Goyle, and the ferret which gave a terrified squeak and took off, streaking toward the dungeons. I don't like people who attack when their opponent's back's turned, says Moody. Stink and hardly scummy thing to do. And the merit, ferret flies up in the air as Moody's wand moves upwards. Never wham! Do wham! That wham! Again wham! Now, I don't know if you've ever seen a ferret. We used to have a couple of ferrets. Ferrets are really, really delicate. We had one fall from the top of its cage about three feet tall to the bottom and broke its back. So, eight feet up, wham, wham, four times. Professor Moody! In comes McGonagall. They're both Scottish, okay? Because <laughs> of their names and, and we're told by their dialect. She comes in and he goes, hello, professor. And there's the ferret. She goes, what, what are you doing? Teaching? No. You know, we don't use what? We don't use transfiguration as a punishment. Because what could they do with it? Okay, they could screw it up. What else? Think about it. If you could turn somebody else into something else. Turn him into a bug? Squish. I mean, it can get really bad, right? <clears throat> Plus, that's her subject. That's what she teaches. Okay? She says, surely Dumbledore mentioned that. He might have mentioned it, yeah. But I thought a good short note. We give detentions, Moody. Okay, let's talk about quote-unquote discipline. Whose work's better? Moody's or detention's? Moody's. What's really going to sink in to the student? Don't do that again. Yeah, I think being bounced off the floor is going to... Nothing like pain. <laughs> so, Moody says, okay, I'll, I'll speak to Snape then. Okay? And Malfoy, when Moody says, your head of house will be Snape, right? He goes, yes, another old friend. Well, ears are buzzing, you know. Harry, Ron, and Hermione are thinking. So, Hermione starts to talk, and Ron says, shh, I, you know, I want to have that memory of Snape the Bouncing Ferret, uh, Malfoy the Bouncing Ferret forever, okay? Next chapter.
I'm skipping a lot. So, unforgivable curses, page 211. So, he gets into class, and he says, top of 211, right then. I've had a letter from Professor Lupin about this class. You've got a pretty thorough grounding and tackling dark creatures, you know, boggarts, et cetera, et cetera. But you're very behind, very behind on dealing with curses. So I've got one year to teach you. And Ron, why, aren't you staying? And he looks at him and goes, you're Arthur Weasley's son. Your dad's a good man. Got me out of a tight spot a while back. He says, so, curses. According to the Ministry of Magic, bottom of 211, I'm supposed to teach you counter curses and leave it at that. Notice, supposed to. What's that tell us? No, He's no, going no. somewhere with that. I'm not supposed to teach you what illegal dark curses look like. You're not supposed to be old enough to deal with it till then. Remember the other day we had that thing where Arthur says, you know, you're not old enough to understand? Well, he's bringing that up. And then, it, then he says, but Dumbledore's got a higher opinion of your nerves. He reckons you can cope. And I say, sooner you know what you're up against, the better. So what has he just kind of elliptically done? Ministry of Magic thinks this. Dumbledore thinks this. Who's he going to follow? Immediately, it puts the two in opposition. Why? Because we're going to get to the end of the book, and it's going to be very stark opposition. Then we're going to get to the beginning of book five, and it's like they're in open warfare. All right? So, he says, what are the worst curses there are? That is, what are the most heavily punished by wizarding law? Bunch of hands rise, and he looks at Ron. Ron's kind of like, eh, is it the Imperius curse or something? He says, ah, oh, yes, your father would know that one. Gave the ministry a hell of a time, you know? So, he pulls out a big glass jar with three big spiders in it. And he sets one of the spiders on the desk in front of him. Okay? And then he pulls out his wand. Imperio. And notice, he doesn't go, Imperial! He just mutters, Imperio. And the spider leaps from his hand starts to swing backwards and forward like on a trapeze. Then it does a backflip. And then it starts tap dancing. And everybody's rip-roaring laughing. This is funny. Think it's funny, do you? You'd like it, wouldn't you, if I did it to you? In other words, if I start making you tap dance in front of everybody. <clears throat> dead silence. <clears throat> Total control. I could make it jump out of the window, drown itself, throw itself down one of your throats, and Ron's backing up, you know, because spider issues. Okay. So what's the Imperius curse do? Mind control. Mind control? It takes away your will. So you can't choose to do something. Why? Because the you that's doing the choose is buried. It replaces your will with somebody else's. All right? So, he says, it can be fought, and I'll be teaching you how, but it takes real strength of character. And not everyone's got it. How do you know not everyone's got it? Well, because in the past, a lot of people were put under the Imperius curse. But he also implies a lot of people faked being under the Imperius curse. Oh, it wasn't me. No, 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 no. Those evil, dark wizards, they had me under their control. It wasn't me that did it. I was crazy, kind of a thing. Okay? So he says, all right, another one. Hermione's hands up. And there's Neville. And Neville goes, the Cruciatus curse? Notice the first word, Cruciatus. It's related to our word for crucifixion, cross. Okay? The cruise part. He says, your name's Longbottom. And I was like, mm hmm. Hmm. You need to see this one a little bit better. So I need to make this spider bigger. So he puts an engorgement charm on it. <clears throat> Makes it a big spider. Okay? Larger than a tarantula. 
I don't know if you've ever seen or held tarantulas. Tarantulas can be varying sizes. Tarantula can be the size of, size of just this part of my hand, that is body with the legs out. Some tarantulas can be this big. I remember being a sophomore in high school, biology class, somebody late one spring day I was wearing a tank top or something, and somebody, you know, brought in a tarantula, and I said, oh, sure. So I took my shirt off, and he puts the tarantula on my back. Because I was told, you know, it's not going to bite you, whatever. It's the eeriest feeling you'll ever have, because, you know, how the legs move. I'll never forget that feeling, okay? So, big old spider. <clears throat> And crucio, and what's it do? It curls up on its back, and its legs all come in, and they're just twitching. And Hermione yells at him to stop. Why? She knows because it's cruel to the spider? No, because Neville's sitting there with his hands on the desk like this, and gripping it till his knuckles are white. We're not told why until much, much later. So... Reducio, he shrinks the spider back to its normal state. It goes back into the jar and probably goes, <laughs> Any others? Hermione. Is that a cadaver? Notice what that sounds like, by the way. Change the V to B. Abracadabra. Okay. He says, yes, the last, the worst, the killing curse. Pulls the spider out, Avada Kedavra. Notice, he roars. Why? Does it take roaring? No. This is for effect. This is teaching pedagogy 101. He really wants it to sink into the student's mind. And we're told, there's a blash of flying, flinding green, blaming, a flash of blinding green light and a rushing sound, as though a vast invisible something was soaring through the air. What is that vast invisible something? Is it death coming to take the spider away, or is it life fleeing from the spider? Something not nice, not pleasant, and there's no counter curse. In other words, I can't teach you how to counter that one. There's no blocking it. You can't do, in other words, Expelliarmus on that. You don't know. <laughs> Probably because if I could, you know, make assumption um, because he's so advanced in magic. He's got, you know, charms or whatever around him. That, but this, we're told, you know, can't be blocked. We're not told if anybody's tried Avada Kedavra on Voldemort. Okay? I, I don't know why, other than it's an unforgivable curse. But we are going to be told later, at one point, somebody in the Ministry of Magic kind of made them forgivable. <laughs> kind of allowed them. So whether it's forgivable or not, you know, it depends on who's in power, I guess. Okay? So he goes on and says, only one person ever survived it, and he's sitting right in front of him. And Harry's like, great, thanks, because all eyes right on him. And he's thinking, so that's how dad and mom died. Flashing green light, which he remembers, okay, and the sound, okay? So, he says again, constant vigilance. In 2005, I was teaching my, my course in London that year, my Harry Potter course. It was the second time I taught it. And the day we were supposed to leave, the day we left, was July 8th, 2005. Um... You were probably too young to be aware of this. But on July 7th, 2005, there were bombings in London. Actually, we were supposed to leave that evening. Evening, July 7th. That morning, around 6 o'clock in the morning, I get a call from our 
our then director of study abroad here at MTSU, saying, don't do anything. We're, you're still playing. And I'm like, what? Because I was asleep. What? You haven't heard? And it's literally 6 o'clock in the morning. Heard what? Turn on the TV. So I turn on the TV. And tube's been bombed. Bus has been bombed. A couple bus is bombed. And so right now, you're still going. So we get on our planes that night. We get into London the next morning, July 8th. And London was like a place I'd never seen before. I'd been to London half a dozen times, I think, before then. Right? Had never seen, ever, never, ever seen in London prior to this a weapon, a handgun, a rifle of any kind. Right? We got there that morning, July 8th, and we were in Heathrow. And I'm not kidding. In the in the big concourses in Heathrow, there's a half dozen cops walking, and they're all carrying semi-automatic weapons with their fingers on the trigger guard. And they're walking abreast. It's like, whoa, what? We're not in Kansas anymore. And then we get into London itself, right? And I mean, we had our talks with our students, you know, we warned them, you know, what's going on and stuff. But we get in the London itself, and, and I take my students on this walking tour down around London, and we go down, you know, Oxford Street, which is the main shopping street in London. It's like Saks Fifth Avenue, New York. And on every building rooftop corner, there's a sniper. And then you get down into central London, where MI5 is, where the various government ministry offices are. I mean, it is like a an armed police state. There are so many cops. Okay? And then we get on the buses. And there are signs that literally say constant vigilance. And I was like, whoa, really makes teaching this book a whole lot easier. Okay? Because what is portrayed in, what gets portrayed in here is what life was like before when Voldemort was coming to power was what like London was like on July 8th and following. Okay? Yes? Green Yeah. Caught it in 2003. Um, in 2003, uh, book five came out. 2007, um, uh, 2005, book six came out. And 2007, book seven came out. I taught all three of those. So we were there for the big London release parties and students, you know, ate those up. Okay? As well as by then also in those summers, 2003, the second film came out. 2005, the third film came out. 2007, the fourth film came out. So they all went and saw them in the IMAX, um, the big London IMAX. Okay? So um, let's see. Let's skip a bunch again, and we go on to very end of the chapter, The Unforgivable Curses. Harry gets a letter back from Sirius, okay? And what does Sirius tell him? I'm coming north, okay? There's rumors. Things have reached me. Go to Dumbledore. He's got Mad-Eye out of retirement. He's reading the signs. Does Harry know what the signs are? Not a clue. Okay. So, the very end of that chapter, 227, Harry thinks what? Shoot. I shouldn't have written that letter to Sirius. Why? If something happens to him, it's my fault. Well, what did Dumbledore try to teach Harry at the end of the previous book? It's not your fault if Peter Pettigrew goes back to Voldemort. Whose fault will that be? Peter Pettigrew's. By Harry saying, it'll be my fault, what's he mentally kind of doing to Sirius? Putting him under an imperious curse. He's taking away his will. Okay? But not literally. Okay? So, next chapter. Beaubaton and Durmstrang. They have another... Another defense against the dark arts class. 
And what does Mad I do? He puts him under what? An unforgivable curse. What, what happens to you, he said, if you use an unforgivable curse? You go to Azkaban, right? No trial. No trial. So he starts putting them under curses. And we see people do funny things. And everybody laughs. And here comes Harry Potter. And he tells Harry, 231, jump onto the desk. Jump onto the desk. Harry bends his knees, prepares to spring, jump onto the desk. And then a voice says, why though? Stupid thing to do, really. Jump on. Notice, Moody is having to repeat this command. He's now said it four times. One, two, three, four times. Okay. And after the one, one, to after the third time is when the little voice says, why though? Stupid thing to do, jump onto the desk again. No, I don't think I will, thanks, says the other voice a little more firmly. I don't really want to. Jump! Now! And the next thing Harry knows is he feels pain. Why? Because he kind of jumps, but he doesn't fully jump. So he smacks his shins into the desk. Okay? And Moody's like, look at that. Potter fought it. Well, what did he say it takes to put off an imperious curse? Strength of character. Strength of character. How do you get that? Just born with it. Are you just born with it? So Harry's just born with it? Uh-uh. Things have to happen to you. What kind of things? Things that affect your life. Okay. Test your metal. Things that test your metal. It's M-E-T-T-L-E, -T -T -E, by the way, not M-E-T-A-L. What else? There's a passage in the New Testament that says, such and such produces, such and such, such and such produces, such and such, such and such produces character. Adversity, what? Adversity builds character. Suffering builds character. Go back to Harry's problem with Dementors. Why does he have a problem? Because Lupin says, you've got dark things in your past that none of these other kids have. These kids are, they got it easy compared to you, Harry. Okay? So, Harry, how would Dudley do with this? Jump? How high? Why? What adversity has he had? He is a spoiled, candy blank. Brat. Okay. Harry, except for his first year and three months, life been essentially what with the Dursleys? A living hell. He's got Dudley beating him up all the time, that's why his glasses are broken. He wears Dudley's hand-me-down clothes. He's not starved, but he is undernourished. Dumbledore will actually tell us later. He doesn't get his eat to eat as much as he should eat, not as much as he wants to eat. Two very different things. Okay. Dudley eats half a pie. Harry probably gets an eighth of a pie, not even a proper amount, so to speak. Okay. So he's been overcoming one adversity, one difficulty, one problem after another for seemingly all his life. Yeah. That builds character. What about Neville? Same thing. Has Neville been overcoming this, though? Not really. No. He's been failing. How did they finally find out Neville actually did have magical power and ability? His uncle held him out a window and, we're told, accidentally <laughs> dropped him. And what did he do? He bounced. <laughs> that showed he's not a squib. Like Filch. That is someone born into a magical family, but without any magical abilities whatsoever. What about Hermione? What do her parents do? You're either dentist or orthodontist. I can't remember which. But they do something with the teeth. She's had it made. Right? So, notice, first.
first time, Harry starts to put it off. Moody puts him through it four more times, and by the end, he can't put him under that imperious curse. And yet, we were told, years ago, when Voldemort was in power, all kinds of fully qualified wizards were put under imperious curses. So what's this tell us about Harry? You don't want to mess with this kid. Not if he really gets going, okay? Um, let's see. Let's skip a bunch again. Hermione keeps going on about elves. Fred and George are like, give it a break. So, Goblet of Fire. We find out what the Triwizard Tournament is. And Dumbledore says, here's how, you know, the, the students will be chosen. There's going to be the Goblet of Fire, and you will put your name in. And the goblet will choose. But this year, you got to be 17. And to make sure that only 17-year-olds do it, he says, I'm going to put an age line around that. Okay? So you got to be over 17 to get by, etc. Fred and George, you know, come up with an aging potion. They try it. They get caught. Doesn't work. Um, so let's go on. Page 269. Time finally comes for the unveiling, so to speak, or for the um, candidates to be chosen. And 269, the goblet spits out a name. Victor Crumb, right? Seeker for the Bulgarian national team which tells us he's probably what nationality? Bulgarian. Bulgarian, which also tells us probably where Durmstrang is. Bulgarian. Bulgaria. Okay. Anybody know anything about Bulgaria? Southern. It's down in the Balkans area. It's next to Romania. It's in parts of Bulgaria that the whole vampire ethos, myth, etc. arises. It's rocky territory. It's highly, um, what's the word I want? It starts with the S, superstitious, okay? But it's not an easy place to live. Durmstrang, okay? So, champion for Bobaton is Fleur Delacour. Anybody know what her name means? Fleur, flower, delicure of the heart. Oh. And she's what looking? Beautiful. Drop dead gorgeous. Why? Because she's part Vila that we were introduced to in the um, Quidditch thing. Hogwarts champion figures, right? Mr. Pretty Boy, Cedric Diggory. Okay. Oh, and then another one pops out. Harry's name comes out. So, when Harry's name comes out, what happens? Silence. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is, it's the tri-wizard. It's not the quad wizard. I can't say quad wizard. It's hard to say. So, Harry has to go off to where the other champions are. And what do Karkaroff and Maxine, Madame Maxine, think of this? It's not fair. Hogwarts gets two. We should each get two. Okay? But Ludo Bagman and Barty Crouch are there for what purposes? Unbiased. Well, yeah, supposedly. <laughs> Why else? Because Barty Crouch is the one who knows all the rules. And what were the rules? If the name comes out, that person has to participate, right? It's a magical binding contract. The only way it can be unbound is what? Death. Okay. So they ask Carrie, did you put your name in? No. Did you put your name in? No. Did you put your name in? No. Snape, you know, was like, we had to expel him. You know. <laughs> so Moody's the one who says somebody cheated. Somebody else put his name in if Potter didn't himself. He also kind of let slip 
in front of the students. He's got a history with Karkaroff, and Karkaroff was a not, not such good character. So here he goes back off to his dorm room, 286, 287, and runs into what? Well, before the dorm room, because before he can get up to his dorm, he has to go through the house common room. What's the house common room doing? Yes! We've got party, you know. But then he gets up to his dorm room. Not so party like. Why? Why is Ron pissed? Come on, man. I mean, because you said this is what you would you could you could have told me. Here's like I didn't do it. Oh yeah, right. Okay. Ron, I'm not stupid, you know. Harry, you're doing a really good impression of it. What happens right there? The friendship is destroyed. I mean, from then until when? First trial. The end of the first test. It's not even the beginning. It's the end of the first test. Okay? So we get the weighing of the wands, and we are finally introduced to Rita Skeeter. Rita Skeeter. Okay? Uh, I'm going to skip a whole bunch. Malfoy, you know, hits Hermione with the Dens Algeo charm, which means what? Dens, heat, dentist, Algeo, increase. Now we're told, and we've not been told this before, I don't think, but we're told what about Hermione's teeth at this point? Before the Dens Algeo, she's got buck teeth. These two teeth are big. Now? They grow below her chin. Okay. And what does Snape say? I see no difference. So she runs off to Madame Pomfrey, and what does Madame Pomfrey do? She shrinks them, and she shrinks them so that they're perfect. Okay. Um, weighing of the wands. Here he sees Ollivander again. And we get to the end of that chapter. Page 312. He gets another letter from Sirius because he wrote back to Sirius saying, no, no, you don't need to come north. And Sirius says, and because Harry also told him about, you know, being selected Triwizard champion, he says, we need to meet, we need to talk, be in the Gryffindor Room, tower, morning of 22nd November. Okay, I know you can look after yourself. Somebody's trying to do harm to you. And we get chapter 19, the Hungarian horn tail. What's the whole purpose of this chapter? Showing you what the first task is going to be. Okay. Why else? What else? All right. It's one to tell us. Hagrid has, Hagrid has a crush. And they cheat. I mean, there is no honor here. Okay? So, when Hagrid has Harry come to him, and he goes off with Harry, and Harry's got his cloak on, and Harry sees the dragons, who else does Harry see? Say, Bill. Madame Maxime and Karkaroff. So, Maxim and Karkaroff both know, and here he assumes that means, therefore, Fleur knows and Crumb knows. Harry knows. Who doesn't? Cedric. Cedric doesn't know. All right? So, he talks with Sirius in the fireplace. We're going to skip a bunch. Sirius says, don't worry about the dragons. We can deal with those. And Sirius tells him what? Karkaroff was a Death Eater. That's what Moody implied earlier. Okay, he did a deal with the Ministry of Magic. He says, you know, he was he came when when I was in Azkaban, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And he goes on and says, you know, Moody was attacked the night before he started at Hogwarts. There's a lot of strange stuff going on, Harry. Harry, why try why try to kill me? Three thirty three. 
Very strange things. Death Eaters are more active. Someone set up the Dark Mark. There's a Ministry of Magic Witch who's gone missing. Harry says who? He says, yeah. And where'd she go missing? In Albania. Well, we've already heard Dumbledore say, my sources tell me that the last place Lord Voldemort was, was in Albania. Why does J.K. Rowling put Dumbledore, uh, Voldemort in Albania? Why Albania? Of all the countries in the world, why that one? Um, no, Transylvania is actually part of Romania. But it's one of those Ias countries. Romania, Bulgaria, um, Albania, etc. They're the Balkans. Okay. Why else? Here's where it might help to know a little geopolitical history. Okay, it is far away. It's more far away from us than it is from them. It's only a six or seven hour flight from London. Okay. Albania was one of the countries in the Warsaw Pact nations. The Warsaw Pact nations were the nations that were essentially governed by the Soviet Union and Moscow, and they were satellite nations. So you have Russia and the Warsaw Pact nations were buffer nations between it and the NATO nations in Western Europe. Okay? Albania was one of those. Albania set up its own communist system, and Albania set up its own constitution, which differed greatly from the Russian one, or the Soviet Union one, because the Soviet Union one guaranteed freedom of religion. Albania was the first nation in the world to totally outlaw religion. It was totally atheist. Okay? I think that's why she puts Voldemort there. Why? He doesn't want to have anything to do with God, meaning what's outside the door of death. That's why he wants to stay alive. He doesn't want to confront what's there. So, um, we will pick up. We got almost where I wanted to be. Uh, we'll pick up with the first task on Monday. And I should have your... Yeah, your papers.